Okay. Turn around. Our next talk, Andre is going to uh, update us on SRS LTE. <coughs> Thanks. So we should be running behind, and that would mean that we are in 2020 in February. It's the second. It's two past two. Yes. <laughs> the, only, the only day ever that Americans get their information. And it's the only. <laughs> and it's the only slot. Oh, oh. <laughs> cool. Uh, so for those of, of you who don't know, uh, we are building uh, open source, end-to-end, -end, um, 3GPP protocol stacks. Uh, so with our software, you can build, uh, like fully in software, run an entire LTE network. So you can have a UE, uh, you have an uh, eNodeB, which is the base station and a, and a core network. You can that run that entirely in, in software with USERPs or, or RF frontends. You can use the eNodeB, connect commercial handsets, so your phone to the eNodeB. Or you can use the UE and connect to a commercial um, cell if you if you want so. Um, and we do all sorts of crazy things with that. So we we put the UEs in cars and in planes and uh, like the satellites and stuff like this. Um, most of us know us obviously through the open source project and um, like we have a big or long history of, of uh, researchers that use it for like security analysis. And that would be uh, like a list of the GSMA, which is a, like a, a central uh, entity that collects um, security vulnerabilities uh, discovered in 3 g p stacks. Um, and uh, out of this list, um, all of those uh, have used SRS LTE. So it's, it's pretty, so eight, eight out of 11 of the recent CVDs have, have used that. And uh, we have a list online on srsid.com, and it lists currently over 165 resource pages research papers using our software for, um, but obviously there's other use cases, not just research or not just re security research. So what I'll be talking about a little bit is uh, the highlights uh, of SRS LTE uh, from, from 2019. We're looking a little bit at, at 2020. Uh, then I'll a little talk about a little bit uh, about the platforms that we're targeting because this has, um, we've extended this a little bit uh, and uh, briefly this uh, touching, well, uh, continuous integration, um, continuous delivery, test and quality assurance in, in general. So in 2019, uh, we had um, three um, releases. So we've uh, been following a, um, like a three-month um, release cycle. Uh, and in early 19, uh, we, uh, we added um, DTD support, so uh, time uh, division duplexing something that is not used here, but uh, in, in China. Um, carrier aggregation uh, to, the, to the UE. We added a, a 3GPP uh, channel simulator, so you could um, basically emulate a channel um, uh, when it um, is received from the UE or transmitted at the e B. Uh, we added paging and user plane encryption uh, to the e B and the, and the EPC. In, o, in 06, um, we uh, basically used those two releases, uh, 1906 and 1909, to um, refactor a big portion of our of our protocol stack. Um, so there hasn't been a lot of features added into th this release, and also the, the next one. So we focused on, on preparing it and, and making it scalable for for all the develop all the developments um, that yeah we were planning to do. Uh, so we did it in, in summer, and in 1909, uh, we started to open source the first. Um, um, 5G and R blocks, which were, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit uh, in detail, but there were kind of extensions to protocol layers, uh, to data plane protocol layers that we had. Um, we started to put uh, MBIoT, which, which has pre previously been um, a closed source um, implementation, we started to put that open source. Uh, through the community, we added uh, circuit, circuit switched fallback uh, so that you can actually use, um, have a network uh, of 2G and 4G and, and have uh, someone um, yeah, falling back to, to, uh, to 2G for, for uh, having calls. Thanks to Howard as well. Yeah, thanks to, to, to Howard for uh, who's unfortunately sick this day. Um, uh, so get be better soon. So uh, we get more, um, <laughs> more additions <laughs> from Howard there. Um, yeah, we also added uh, conformance testing, um, like we started to add the conformance testing architecture there. Um, and in 1912, so just in December, 
uh, we added uh, for the protocol layers uh, for, for 5G, we added uh, support for RC, message packing, unpacking, and also for interacting with 5G core, uh, we started to add NGAP packing. Uh, as well as uh, some sidelink support, I will be talking ab uh, about this uh, later on. So for 2020, we are actually planning to change our release cycle a little bit. Um, so those past two years in which we've done uh, a three-month uh, cycle, they've been quite stressful. Um, not only because it takes a lot of time to prepare releases and, uh, you know, fix. You know, everyone wants to, you know, get, you know, pull requests merged in and then you need to make sure that uh, you you know, do the quality assurance okay and that everything uh, does not, you know, break and you don't introduce regressions, um, but especially the, the 06 and the 012 release, they were quite hard because it was close to Christmas, everyone was on vacation, um, and, um, and then that's why we, we de decided to, to go uh, for that six month uh, cycle from now on basically, so that there won't be a 20 or three. Uh, so we will adopting kind of the Ubuntu cycle and, and releasing in, in, uh, in 04 and in 010 because that better fits our development cycle. So basically after the, well, after the start of the year, you have enough time to, to prepare things and, and at least that's what is our intention. Uh, we'll see. Uh, and then for the autumn release, after the summer, everyone comes back and you develop and test and then you have a good uh, autumn release. So that, that's what we were looking at uh, for, t for 2020 at least. Let's see if we uh, change that in 21, I don't know. Okay, so what are the upcoming uh, features for 2020? So we will add more 5G and R stuff uh, for sure. And something that we um, are looking at is uh, NSA, so non-standalone mode, which uh, basically means that and, and all deployments that you're currently out there, they are uh, non-standalone, which basically means that you always have a 4G, which kind of serves as an anchor carrier, and uh, all the control, all the signaling is going over 4G always. And, um, and the NR is just to offload and to provide high throughput essentially. And, um, and it only supports uh, the data plane. So you know, B you know, can ask to enable a 5G bearer and then you have additional uh, capacity and additional channel that goes over, uh, over NR. But you always need 4G, so there's no, no way. Uh, as opposed to standalone where you really have on the right side like a 5G core, so a core network that um, um, you know exists and, and speaks the the, the the 5G language and and can really run independently, uh, well standalone, <coughs> as the name says. Um, and as for most of our development developments, we are focusing on the UE first. Uh, so this will uh, be added um, in the beginning and then later on the the E0B. What we have done so far is um, the user plain protocol uh, layers, uh, like all the extensions to Mac, RC, PDCP, they're, they're pretty much done. Uh, the, the full control plane is, is there uh, for non-standalone, so announcing that my phone is uh, able to speak 5G and stuff like this that you need to do, and, um, and that's all, all there. Uh, so what we're looking at now is to, to do the control plane. Uh, I mean, not really control plane, but uh, the part of the NR that is still uh, needed uh, for, let's say, on, on this side. Uh, so there's still a little bit of control and, and, and uh, signaling needed. Um, adding this and then we're ex extending the PHY. Uh, so we will be writing a, a x86 implementation of, of the NR PHY, um, uh, as well as uh, in RFSOC, so an FPGA-based implementation that uh, leverages uh, some hardware effect uh, on, on Silinx uh, fabric. And we will targeting those. Um, and uh, the upper protocol is there just run on, on the arms uh, in, in this platform or on x86. So this is not, um, this is no problem. Uh, CV2X, uh, uh, so basically we've heard about uh, car to car communication um, using uh, 11P. So there's kind of two competing standards uh, for, for car to car communication. One is based on Wi Fi and the other one is the, the cellular. Um, way and that, that's why they put C there so it's the cellular uh, V2X and um, so basically what it means if you're if you're talking in a cellular context is that usually like a phone is is connected to a, 
uh, to a, a base station, and there's uplink downlink going through um, back and forth between a, a UE and a base station. And um, if there's if you have two UEs that want to communicate, you always need to go through the um, through the base station. So you're essentially having a round trip time or a round trip uh, between two UEs. It's like up to the base station, down to the UE, up to the um, base station, and down uh, to the UE again. And the idea is, uh, I mean, if they're close enough to each other, we could just you know, have a, a side link, so SL, uh, so let those two devices um, communicate directly with, with each other. And that's, that's essentially what, what, um, um, what side link brings using LTE sig signals, uh, more or less, like modified versions of that, but um, more or less LTE 5 and 5G5 in, in the future. And we have started to, to implement that, and, 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 and we are targeting uh, like all four uh, modes. Uh, we have a full file layer implementation of Sidelink, and uh, we have uh, joined a, um, a Etsy-sponsored um, interoperability testing uh, in December in Malaga, where we uh, essentially uh, tested interoperability with all uh, like implementation from all vendors, like from test equipment manufacturers, as well as all baseband chips um, and baseband, yeah, baseband chips that are then put into uh, units, onboard units from, from, from uh, various vendors. And, and, and that's, that's something that we will open source uh, as well in the next release. Um, MBIT, I've been uh, briefly mentioning that. So we've been developing this in, in private, and, uh, and, but then later last year decided to, to open source that. And um, we will uh, be adding a full file layer for the UE and, and the e b into mainline uh, SRS LTE. The, and that, that's something that you can get then. So you, you, uh, in most countries, if you turn on uh, GeoForce4, you spot um, in the 800 megahertz band more or less, um, like a, from in some uh, networks, you, you spot something like this, which is uh, an MBIT carrier uh, in band in the LTE signal, sometimes also out of band here to, to not waste those resources. Um, and that's something that you can then uh, sync on and, and decode. The reason for not putting the upper layers is, uh, is only resources. So we, we do have them, but we need to uh, uh, yeah, refactor them and, and put them there. But the, f the FI will be, will, be, will be there. Uh, and that's something that you can then have a, like a graphical user interface with uh, constellation, sync, and some message decoding uh, of the broadcasting messages. Then CRMQ, that's something that um, we've been briefly talking about uh, in the last um, Fostem, where we uh, basically the idea is to to run uh, LTE networks without needing, without requiring um, RF hardware. Uh, so basically to lower the, the entrance level a, a little bit. So 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 you can run an LTE network, but you all, always need need at least two relatively expensive um, <coughs> devices um, and a few computers. And uh, and with this you can you could do that. Um, basically without hardware. Um, and uh, for us as developers, that's uh, pretty attractive. Uh, I mean, we, we do have hardware, but we want to use it for, yeah. for um, running wall grind and then and, uh, address sanitizer and GDBing, uh, stuff that you cannot uh, do if you're, if you're running over the air uh, with a usurp. Uh, so you want to run stuff faster, slower, pause, and stuff like this, and, and maybe uh, emulate uh, more complex scenarios with multiple e Bs that are very difficult to control. Um, and to orchestrate. Um, and so the idea uh, was to, uh, to basically use CRMQ and, and instead of sending those IQ samples, I mean, we're still running the full FI uh, to USERP. Uh, we are uh, you know, using CRMQ to send it uh, over IPC or IP to a receiver. Um, and then we, yeah, we basically added timestamp synchronization for that because LTE is a, like very much depends on, on time uh, stamps and, and, and um, you know time synchronization. Uh, so we, we added support for that, um, and then we've also removed all the dependencies from system timers in the UE and the ENOB, um this year. So there's no all the all the timings derived from the samples that come from 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 CRMQ in that case, or from the user uh, if you if you run it normally. And that allows you to run a full end-to-end -end system like in the CMake um, like testing thing without requiring containers and other dependencies. So it's very basic, but it allows you to 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 run those things with a, with a make test basically. And that's just a screenshot of how how this looks like. So it's three consoles. Here you have the core network. 
uh, SRS EPC, then the eNodeB, um, and then here you have a, a UE that attached to, you know, it's a great channel. Look at this. Uh, look at this constellation. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and you you see like it's it just behaves as as if you're uh, running uh, over the air. Uh, very good. And it's all running on, on one machine, and, and, and you can debug it, you can GDB it, you can single step through it. It's, it's, it's all, all good, at least on the, on the RAN side. Okay. SS eNodeB Outlook. So, so actually, SS eNodeB is always a little bit like the, the stepchild of, of ours. So, so we are like focusing on, on the UE so much. Uh, but it's, it's not, I mean, we, we really don't mean that. Um, but the good news is that we will be focusing on SSE not B uh, a lot more in the, in the upcoming months. Um, so we not only add new features, uh, like handover, for instance. So this is needed if, if, if you have two cells and, you, and your UE moves. Um, so it's leaving basically the, the cell range of one base state to the other one. You need to do a handover. Uh, so that, that will be added. There will also be support for carrier aggregation. So a single UE cannot un only have a primary uh, carrier, but you can add multiple carriers uh, to it. So, and that's needed for, um, yeah, for increasing bandwidth, obviously. Um, so uh, yeah, you, you can combine up to, well, five in release 10 and up to 32 in theory uh, in, I don't know, release 13, I think. Uh, so we see how, how much DSP we have um, to do that. And uh, we will be focusing on performance and stability, stability a lot. So we, we're going to deploy this, and this needs to be uh, like, uh, like rock, be rock solid. Um. Target platforms. So up until now, uh, we have really just, um, I mean, the, the, the priority has always been on x86. Uh, so the phi is so computationally intense that it's not really uh, viable to run a full LTE uh, on any, anything else, like the, the phi, on anything else than x86. Um, just because all of the, you know, all of the, like, CMD that is required and, 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 and even ARM, uh, I mean, it does have SIMD, but it's, it's even if, a, if you have a powerful, uh, like the Snapdragon or, or Raspberry Pi 4, uh, it's still hard. I mean, you can run uh, like smaller bandwidths, like six PRBs is probably okay, but a 20 megahertz or 20, 20 megahertz LTE signal, uh, there's no way you can run the entire PHY uh, in an ARM. Um, um, but it's getting better. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, <coughs> Yeah, the idea is um, to basically widen that a little bit because of, obviously it's getting better. Um, and uh, up until till now, having focused on, on, on x86 only, we will expand that. Um, so we do uh, support ARM already, um, but we will extend this to, to, to sync ultra scale. Uh, so in fact, we have a, a, full, um, a full PHY uh, for downlink on, on, in, in FPGA. Uh, that basically offloads all the heavy stuff uh, to an FPGA to, to, to sync ultra scale plus uh, and only runs the, the, the protocol layers uh, L2, L3, so the upper non so, uh, not so DSP critical things uh, in ARM. Um, and, and that's something that we do with the same uh, code base. So we are, this is not something different or a different fork or so, so we are intending to maintain this and, and use the same code base that, that runs on, on all those uh, platforms. Uh, and we will see, I mean, maybe the, the ARM, I haven't looked at the, at the uh, NVIDIA uh, ones, um, perhaps a little bit more performant, but, um, but maybe you can even run a, a bigger cell there with all these P in, in, in the ARM. Um, that would be, would be cool. So besides the wide range of RF hardware, we're also targeting uh, a wide range of these P platforms here. Um, Quality assurance. Um, so th this is, yeah, like if you want to target um, like commercial crate, uh, I mean, depending on what that means, uh, um, deployments and, and, and things, I mean, you have to really look after, after quality and then after, you know, regressions that you do in your development and um, that you introduce and then that basically what, you, what you're, uh, you know, putting there to a customer, sending to a customer or putting um, 
on GitHub that actually uh, satisfies your, your needs. And one of the building steps is obviously a continuous integration platform um, that we have. Um, and then we currently have uh, around 600, not, not exactly 600, it's a little bit less depending on what configuration you have, uh, unit tests that we are constantly running in, 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 in Jenkins um, that is uh, building for, uh, for x86 and ARM. Uh, running Atro Sanitizer, Valgrind, um, Limited and, and ARM, uh, and then basically executing those tests on a pull request basis uh, and, and periodically in, in Jenkins as well. Uh, so we also uh, try to uh, leverage from static code analysis tools that is available for open source projects, uh, like Coverity, um, a tool from, from Synopsys, uh, as well as LGTM. And that's something that we basically did in the, in the last release. Uh, so mm, by looking at the initial analysis, you kind of had a code quality batch of E, which is like the, like the, the worst you can get. Uh, uh, I mean, it wasn't that bad, actually. Uh, and, then, and then we uh, you know, addressed a few of them. Some of them were, yeah. Anyway, so you, you get now an A, a and, an, and, a, and I hope we will get an A+. Plus, uh, so that's, that would be the best. That's the second best. Uh, um, but it also depends, obviously, on the ratio between uh, code, lines of code and errors that you have. Um, yes, and then, obviously, uh, unit tests not enough, so we are RF people. So we have also an RF into, uh, continuous integration uh, that we call RFCI internally that we heavily use for yeah, finding regression bugs and, um, and things like that. that target or that are related to, to RF things like, um, like yeah, DSP and, and RF related uh, issues. And we have been developing an in-house test bed um, where we used uh, Jenkins that SSH into machines, launch Docker, uh, Python scripts that um, you know, post-process results and analyze logs and stuff like this, create reports. And um, that's also, that we ex that's also something that we execute on each pull request and periodically like long running handover tests, uh, 24 hours, 48 hours uh, that we run um, you know, weekly, on a weekly basis. Um, something that uh, uh, yeah, we'd like to announce uh, here as well is that uh, we've recently um, you know, uh, agreed with Salesforce.com that we are cl more closely working together uh, and basically adopting um, because this in-house testbed, I mean, it, it was a good thing for us and it worked for us. Um, but um, there's a tool called, or a, yeah, like a, a software called Osmo GSM Tester, which uh, has um, a lot more features that, that, that we uh, had. And, and uh, it just made a lot of sense to kind of get SRS LTE support into Osmo GSM Tester uh, so everyone else can use that. Um, it's already uh, like open source. It's an OsmoCom project. Um, so we will be adding Osmo GSM, uh, SSID support to Osmo GSM Tester. Um, and then um, basically we'll rebuild uh, that uh, entire framework with running tests and uh, producing logs and, and reports and, and, and uh, probably also trying to make those um, you know, available for, for, uh, for the outside world. Uh, and also extend the, the RF infrastructure. And that's um, uh, a photograph that Harad actually took. So that's an uh, installation uh, in, in, uh, in Sysmocom, uh, where, there's, where Sysmocom has built like a rack and a 19-inch um, uh, one, uh, one U, um, essentially, um, housing that, that houses uh, like various RF front ends and all connected cable together with variable antenna all controlled um, remotely. So this allows you to, you know, reproduce experiments to run those uh, continuously. Um, and that's something that we are looking forward to and, and extending also uh, Osmo GSM Tesla for that. Another thing was um, conformance testing. So I will briefly touch this. Uh, so. All the UEs that we have, all the phones that we have, um, they're, um, they're running conformance tests, so they need to uh, obey uh, like tests that 3GPP actually uh, it does. And you usually do that, you go to a testing entity, you get a Rodon Schwartz uh, 1 million uh, you know, euro thing that you can test your UE with. Nobody can afford that. Um, so what we did is uh, to use Eclipse Titan, it's an Eclipse uh, project, it's a TTCM3 compiler that is actually uh, the language that the conformance tests are implemented in. 
and, and basically wrote a, a system simulator that basically acts like this guy uh, without phi, uh, fake phi, and that's something that we can run on a Raspberry Pi. It's all integrated in our uh, conform in our continuous integration, and um, um, you know, this is something that um, that uh, like really helps to to make sure that you actually uh, does what it is supposed to do and it complies with all the um, you know all the conformance uh, requirements uh, on the protocol uh, side of things. And, and we are running fully unmodified protocol stack there uh, to test against uh, the tests. And that's it. Thank you. Is your uh, zero Q transport LTE specific in any way or no. usable by any sort of RF? No, I mean, there's like, uh, we have. Um, Could you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so is the R zero uh, MQ uh, transport LTE specific or not? Um, there is uh, like timestamp synchronization and resampling. And the resampling thing is something that you just you know put a, a base rate because how the UE connects to a base station depends uh, on the bandwidth. So it uh, first surges in a lower bandwidth, then changes the bandwidth. So you need to do a little bit of resampling uh, there. But I mean, other than that, no, it's it's uh, it, it's not LTE specific at all. No. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Uh, yes, um, the question was uh, if we have been looking at the Pluto uh, to implement LTE. Yes, so two things. Uh, the Pluto, like LTE is like really requires strict timing. Um, so we need to know when we receive samples, what the time stamp is and when we transmit them because the transmit is always um, you know, aligned to the, to the receive side. And what we need to add there uh, is timestamp uh, support because the Pluto LibIO doesn't have timestamp support. Uh, Ooh. Very good. And we're really looking forward to that. So then the extension of, uh, uh, of that would be, uh, yes, you could perhaps run the MBAOT um, on the Pluto itself, definitely on the host, uh, but you still have your two, a USB 2 bandwidth uh, limitation. So you can definitely run the, the MBIOT and probably is like a small LTE cell, 6 PRBs, 15 PRBs, but definitely not the, the bigger ones because they're like 20 megahertz. So you, you, and then you're not getting that over the USB 2. One remark. If yes. you're going to Jenkins, there are better alternatives. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. What's your plan on getting a better tool chain? And yeah, I mean, we just use Jenkins for continuous integration, really. Uh, so it's not. Are you already using it? Oh yeah, yeah, it's deep water. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, of the CRMQ? Uh, ah, no. I mean, we don't. So the question is, if we if we have SMS support, so. Uh, no, no, we, we don't do that. Um, I mean, it's 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 possible to send SMS over NAS signaling from the from the EPC, um, and I know of like a few like users on the list who have looked into this, uh, but there is not it's not officially supported in, in our in, in the open source. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Is it possible to change the frequency uh, the channel plan? Uh, use it, uh, <coughs> seven centimeter yeah, I mean, radio. yeah, ham radio, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's a few ham radio users uh, I know of, uh, and then they, yeah, obviously, I mean, it's the limitation is the RF that you're using, and we are agnostic, we are RF agnostic, so we can. Um, I wasn't sure if I should change existing channels to GSM channels, to my frequencies, or add additional channels. Yeah, I mean, like, so there's a, like, uh, we, we have a lookup table for all the 3GPP, uh, like, official channels, uh, and maybe you cannot directly um, use your channel of interest because it's not an official one, but you can obviously add this uh, if you want. Yeah, I mean, I don't see a problem there. Yeah. 